like any other sexual orientation, my orientation has been present from my very earliest childhood memories. And what that means is that every time I was spanked as a child, it felt like something profoundly sexual was happening to me against my will. Hello, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Prostasia Foundation's podcast podcast series, Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. Today, I'm excited to speak with Gillian Keenan. Gillian is a widely published freelance writer, the author of the book Sex with Shakespeare, and she's also an expert on spanking. Hello, and uh, thanks for joining us today, Gillian. Yeah, thank you for having me. So to begin with, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, and if you don't mind, something about your sexuality. Yeah, sure. Uh, Well, my name, of course, is Gillian Keenan. I'm a journalist and foreign correspondent based here in Nairobi, Uh, and I'm also the author of a book called Sex with Shakespeare, which is about how Shakespeare helped me come to terms with my innate, unchosen, and lifelong spanking fetish. But I know that there is uh, no general consensus on what people mean when they use the term fetish. So just to clarify, uh, when I, what I mean when I say that is that spanking occupies the place in my life that sex occupies in the lives of most people. So when most of us think about having sex, we assume that a, a penis and or vagina are involved. Can spanking also be a type of sex? Okay, so spanking is sexual. Uh, And that's true for cultural, historical, and, you know, most importantly, physiological and biological reasons. But no, spanking is not sex, and here's why. It's very trendy at the moment, uh, especially in sort of open-minded progressive circles, for people to broaden the term sex to include absolutely everything. (laughs) One time I even had someone tweet at me that for her, talking is sex. And of course, that's fine on an individual level. People can, people can uh, frame their own sexual preferences however they like. But on a broader scale, uh, I'm really reluctant to expand the definition of sex beyond its traditional meanings, by which I mean genital, anal, and oral sex. Because when we expand the definition of sex, we're also expanding the definition of non-consensual sex in a word, rape. And that has really serious criminal justice implications. So no, I Mm. don't believe non-consensual spanking is rape, but it is sexual battery, and here's why. As a society, we already know that non-consensual spankings are sexual battery because that's how we prosecute them. Adults who non-consensually spank other adults are charged with sexual battery. We saw this a couple of years ago in the case of one employer in Tennessee who spanked an employee. So my argument is just that the existing laws and protections that we already have should be expanded to include all people regardless of age. Something that we already recognize as sexual battery doesn't stop being sexual battery merely because the victim is a child. So uh, let me clarify that a little. So does it matter whether the person administering the battery has a sexual motivation behind it? Does that make a difference to the character of whether it's sexual abuse or just, I say just in in air quotes, just physical abuse? No, absolutely not. Um, I don't think sexual abuse ever depends on the mindset of the perpetrator. And I think most people agree with me. For example, if a man rapes a woman to fulfill a gang initiation ritual instead of for his own sexual gratification, it's still rape. His mindset is really irrelevant to the crime he has committed. The problem is the act itself, not his intentions. So in in that way, I suppose um, there's really no difference in, in in the way that you're presenting it between spanking that's intended as discipline and spanking that is intended uh, to give sexual gratification. Is that how you would say it? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously no difference. It's the same physical act. Uh, And I think the comparison to spousal rape is really strong here. A marriage certificate does not magically transform the act of rape into something acceptable, just like disciplinary intentions don't magically transform child battery into anything other than what it is. So that's really interesting. And and I guess that sort of informs the approach that we have to take towards this problem. I mean, um, uh, are countries uh, dealing with this 
uh, as, as a form of battery or, or what's the situation? I know you've been in South Africa recently and there was some, uh, some development there, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah, we have great news coming out of my adopted home continent. Um, the South African Constitutional Court just criminalized child battery at home. So it joined the almost 60 other countries that have already outlawed spanking kids, which is great. Um, it's obvious that the world is moving in the right direction. I'm just really looking forward to the day when the United States catches up. <laughs> yeah, so is there any, any, any movement in the United States? Or what do, we, what do you think we have to do to get there? I, well, that's a, that's a really huge question. Um, I tend to be, if I'm honest, a bit pessimistic about these things. Um, I don't think that there is any meaningful movement in the United States. Um, obviously, there are isolated campaigns, but there has been very little meaningful legislation proposed. Um, and right now, child battery is sanctioned by the state in uh, all of the United States. In other words, spanking is legal in all 50 states. Um, which is, to me, absolutely absurd. Uh, like I said, we already recognize spanking as sexual battery when one adult does it to another adult. Um, I cannot for the life of me imagine why sexual battery would stop being sexual battery just because your victim is a child. Well, one of the, one of the things that makes it more complicated, I guess, is the... Uh, um, the idea that some Christians have, certainly not all Christians, that this is, you know, the way that God wants us to uh, discipline our children. Um, how, can we, how can we really get over that religious freedom argument? And so is there a way that we can both, you know, um, be comfortable with consensual spanking between adults um, and caring about children and, you know, uh, uh, embracing spirituality? Well, I mean, I, I get the religious freedom counter argument a lot. Um, and I think that it's kind of disingenuous. I have never met someone who claims that a sincere practitioner of, let's say, 15th century Aztec spirituality should be allowed to have the state sanctioned right to practice child sacrifice just because it's their religion. Um, we kind of recognize that religious freedoms end when someone else's human rights begin. Um, and I think people would laugh if someone tried to use a religious justification to decriminalize spousal battery. So if, uh, if religion can't be used as a legal justification to excuse any other kind of assault or battery, I don't see why it could be used um, persuasively to justify child battery. Mm. So... Um... So we, we had a, um, a little collaboration between us, didn't we? Uh, trying to uh, get Facebook to, to recognize the abusive character of, um, of, the, uh, of some of the spanking groups that we found on, or that you found online. Um, so tell us a little bit about those groups. So, um, as you know, um, some responsible activists pointed me in the direction of a few... Um, pro-spanking Facebook groups that purport to be parenting groups, but they're obviously just platforms for repressed spanking fetishists to exercise some of the darker corners of their fantasies on non-consenting children and to encourage other parents to do the same. Um, the, the fact is, as I said myself, I'm a spanking fetishist, and sometimes it takes one to know one. Um, I... I don't like to lump myself in the same category with these people because whereas my sexuality is adult and responsible and consensual and these repressed fetishists are frankly getting their jollies on the bodies of children, um, I, I can recognize it because there's enough commonality there for me to spot these predators when I see them. I often use the term sex-oriented to describe most people, that is, people who are oriented towards sex. Um, people who are sex-oriented don't recognize fetishistic predators, but I do because I'm a fetishist also. So uh, I really enjoyed working with you to hopefully uh, eventually get Facebook to change its community standards and stop tolerating these um, child abuse groups.
Exactly. Well, I mean, we haven't gotten there yet, but uh, I think one of the most uh, unique contributions that our collaboration has brought to this issue is that um, too often child protection and the consensual kink community are seen as being uh, incompatible with each other. And I think what we've done is demonstrating that that's not the case and that members of the consensual kink or BDSM communities uh, do care about children. Most of them do. I mean, certainly there are a few bad apples, but mostly uh, they care about children. They care about consent. So I'd like to ask you, what do you think that the consensual kink community can teach the broader community about abuse prevention in general? I think that's a great question. Um, something that I really wish more people knew is this. Uh, as I said, <laughs> most people are sex oriented, which is obviously great. We need that for the survival of the species. Um, but what most people don't realize and what we haven't even as a culture developed the language and the terminology to really discuss yet is the fact that a minority of us are not sex oriented. We're oriented towards an object identity or activity that is not sex. Um, as you know, in my case, that's spanking. But the bottom line is that like any other sexual orientation, my orientation has been present from my very earliest childhood memories. And what that means is that every time I was spanked as a child, it felt like something profoundly sexual was happening to me against my will because that's exactly what was happening. And I'm not the only person to have this experience. I get emails every single week, sometimes every single day, uh, from other people who describe how sexually violated they also felt by their own childhood spankings. And I wish more people, and especially more parents, knew about this risk. Because, I mean, <laughs> no disciplinary intention is ever worth the risk of making a child feel sexually violated by a parent. Mm, mm. Um, so uh, what should we do um, to, um, if sometimes also it can, it can occur in the other direction, is, can't it, when a child sort of gains an awareness of, um, of their kink before they've reached the age of consent and they may sort of, seek it out or start to pursue it. What can we do as parents and caregivers and adults to try and stop children from putting themselves in a position where they're vulnerable to abuse? So in this respect, I think that my sexuality, sexual identity, sexual orientation, whatever you want to call it, is no different than any other sexual identity. Um, kids who are growing up heterosexual and sex oriented, that is to say, totally normative, um, will have questions about their sexual identities before they reach an age where it's appropriate for them to act on those curiosities and explore. Um, the same goes for homosexual kids or bisexual kids. Um, kids of all sexual identities have questions. They're curious. They, they sometimes wish they could explore, but um, they haven't yet reached the age of consent or they haven't yet reach the age where they realize how to practice sexuality in a safe, responsible, and ethical way. Um, and I think that the, the ways to protect uh, children who are growing up with an emerging sexual fetish is the same way that we protect kids who are growing up with any other kind of emerging sexuality, which is to make answers to their questions available in age-appropriate and responsible ways, um, to emphasize practices that keep people safe as they uh, engage in sexuality, whether that's using a condom in the case of sex-oriented people or using a safe word in uh, the case of people who are oriented towards some part of the BDSM spectrum. Um, the bottom line is, I think that protecting kids with a minority sexual identity is the same as protecting kids with a normative sexual identity. Mm. So uh, I'm going to pivot to uh, something that we haven't sort of planned to talk about, but it, since it's sort of come up, um, your your YouTube channel uh, is is doing very well. Uh, you you post videos about spanking uh, and and other sort of related topics. Do you uh, um, do you think those are um, appropriate for children who are interested in the topic but who aren't of the age of consent yet? Is that something that you're trying to um, educate uh, 
people of you know under 18 or is that really meant for over 18 uh, viewers this is tricky and I it's something that I wrestle with myself because I wrote a book about as I said um, how Shakespeare helped me come to terms with my fetish uh, I now make videos about what it's like to live with a fetish and although all of my books and articles and videos are informative in content and never pornographic at all um, I certainly have wrestled with questions about whether there is an age appropriate level um, for people to engage with my work. Um, I think there is some self-loathing, some internalized self-loathing that comes out when I wrestle with these questions. Because right now there are YouTube channels where people discuss sexual health or uh, homosexual identities or transgender identities in informational ways. And I don't really wrestle mm. with the question of whether that's appropriate for children. Um, but I do think some internalized self-loathing comes out when I think about my own work. Um, it's, it's something that I'm still working through. Uh, I certainly was a fetishist from, as I said, my very earliest memories. And obviously science doesn't know where that comes from. Um, I'm glad to say scientists are spending their money researching more important things like cures for cancer. So I, I'm not going to complain about that. <laughs> we don't know what causes fetishism. Uh, I am strongly of the opinion that it is absolutely not caused by childhood trauma. In fact, I, it's more than an opinion. I know for certain that fetishism is not caused by childhood trauma. Um, and that people who yeah. say that are as wrong as the now widely discredited um, opinion that... Uh, that you remember what they used to say in the in back in the seventies, uh, sort of the psychiatric um, explanation for homosexuality was that it was caused by absent fathers and overbearing mothers. Uh, that was a ridiculous theory and was wrong. And the theory that fetishism is caused by childhood trauma is similarly ridiculous and also wrong. So while we know what doesn't yes. cause it, we don't know for sure what does cause it. But the fact is, uh, it was there from my earliest memories, and so I certainly had questions. Uh, I do remember once when I was maybe 11 or 12 years old, I saw an episode of the sitcom Frasier. I don't know if you remember that show, but uh, it has yes. a character who's a psychiatrist. And there's one episode where a, a, he's a radio psychiatrist and a caller calls in and asks a question about uh, erotic spanking. Uh, I think says like, are you the spanker or the spanky? And, Everyone kind of laughs about it. It's just a punchline. But obviously that really st stuck with me as all references to spanking always did uh, because I'm a fetishist. Uh, so at age, I want to say 11 or 12, I kind of awkwardly approached my mom and I said, why are some people like into spanking each other? And I remember she went, oh, because they're fucked up. Uh, <laughs> but the, the point is, I, it took me a long time for me to realize that my obsession with spanking was, in fact, sexual. Um, but um, I, I was curious and I did have questions. And I do think that my life would have been easier if simply the fact that it's okay to be obsessed with something other than sex... Um, it's healthy and natural to be obsessed with something other than sex. <laughs> um, and, you know, as, as I got older, I could have started to learn how to explore that ob obsession in safe and responsible ways. Um, so I, I do personally wish that more information had been available to me. But like I said, we're so early in this conversation about yeah. um, minority sexual identities with regards to kinks and fetishes and, and all of that, um, that I, I think it's almost too soon for me to have reached an opinion on at what age and to what degree it's appropriate for kids to start learning uh, uh, about these things. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, at the moment, uh, I think by default, um, YouTube is sort of making those decisions for us in a lot of cases. YouTube is... Uh, uh, deciding you know what kind of content um is 
uh, allowed online and, and what isn't. And, and this, I feel, um, is something that needs to be a broader conversation. We need to have child development experts. Um, we need to have people from the consensual kink community. We need to have, um, uh, you know, um, technology experts and, and all of these people coming together to make these decisions rather than just defaulting to um, a decision that's made behind closed doors in corporate offices in Silicon Valley. Um, have you had trouble with censorship of your channel at any time yet? Um, I agree with everything that you just said. This needs to be collaborative. And I, to my delight, have not had to deal with any censorship whatsoever, um, both Patreon, which is the platform that funds my YouTube channel, and YouTube itself have made no efforts to block me off as 18 plus. Um, I think both platforms are aware of the fact that some informational and non-pornographic sexual content uh, can be available to minors in a responsible way. And I would say this, and I feel strongly about this, if anyone is upset by the idea of a minor watching an informational, non-pornographic video about spanking, you should be a lot more upset at the reality that that same minor can be forced to non-consensually endure a real spanking. If there are questions mm -hmm. about whether children should be watching a video about it, there definitely should be questions about whether children should be non-consensually experiencing it. Indeed. Uh, well, it's uh, interesting that you, you mentioned your platform on Patreon as well. Patreon was the company that, in fact, hosted uh, Prosergia Foundation and some of our experts and stakeholders in a meeting about this topic. And, uh, in fact, uh, in the week that we're going to be releasing this video interview, we're going to be launching a set of principles at the Internet Governance Forum, uh, which came out of that meeting at Patreon, uh, sort of giving some guidance to internet companies about um, how taking content down isn't always the best, uh, most child protective option because sometimes the information that's being taken down may be sex education material, it may be um, child sexual abuse prevention material, um, it may just be expressive content that is uh, legitimate and, and helpful um, uh, to have online, sometimes with an appropriate age gateway. Um, but the, the point we're trying to get across is that sometimes uh, leaving content up and making it available um, is the less harmful option than taking it down. You really have to uh, look at things in a contextual, uh, you know, in context and, and take a decision based on um, all of the people who are going to be uh, harmed or, um, or, or helped by this content staying up or, or being removed. So um, we're... we're Getting towards the end of, of our chat, I just have a couple of uh, closers. What's the single biggest misunderstanding about sex that you wish you could correct? I think it's just what I said before, that um, while some people are sex-oriented, most people are sex-oriented, not everyone is. Um, and particularly with regards to how we treat our children's bodies, um, we need to be responsible about that. Um, there are many ways to sexually assault a child, and uh, I think children deserve to be protected from every way. So this has been fascinating. Um, how can people find out more? How can they uh, learn more from you about, about these topics? Yeah, um, thank you for asking. Uh, like I said, my book, Sex with Shakespeare, which came out from Harper Collins, uh, excuse me, um, my book, Sex with Shakespeare, which came out a few years ago from HarperCollins' William Morrow, is available on Amazon.com and, you know, any place else where books are sold. Um, and I'm on <laughs> social media. I'm on Twitter at, at Jillian Keenan. Uh, I'm on YouTube at YouTube.com slash Jillian Keenan says, hi, hi. Uh, <laughs> I'm also online at um, www.jillian-keenan.com. Um, and like I said, I'm also on Patreon. If anyone generously wants to support my work, uh, you can find me at patreon.com slash Jillian Keenan. Excellent. Well, we're going to include links to all of those resources in the information part of this podcast or vodcast. So uh, thank you once again 
for taking the time to chat. It's been absolutely uh, fascinating, and, uh, and I hope you have a great day. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeremy. And thank you for watching this episode. We'll be back again next month with another episode in sex, human rights, and CSA prevention. To make sure you don't miss it, please subscribe to our podcast, or if you're watching on YouTube, there's a button right here you can press to subscribe to our channel. Thanks again. See you next time.